120 different species in the Great Basin, Mojave Deserts, for that period of time, southern genera. 90s to present, you know, just try to piece all this stuff together to come up with some ecological view of these things. So I'll focus more on ecology today than anything else. So basically these, these springs are in this area that you see here on the map, that's the Great Basin of Mojave Deserts. An important thing to see in that, that picture is a graph is a number of north-south oriented mountain ranges. There are about 150 mountain ranges in Death Valley, I mean, in the Great Basin, running north and south. And even with that, it's the most mountainous region in the United States, but also the driest. What a contrast. But all these springs are sort of small, they're found singular in provinces you see down below the next picture down. They're isolated from other aquatic systems. They've been isolated for long periods of time and they do not, they're not tributary to anything else. They come from the only water over large areas. They occur from mountain tops to the lowest valley floors in all geology. So in this region, there's probably 40,000 springs. And each spring is environmentally distinct by water chemistry, current velocity, aspect, elevation, temperature, EC, all these types of things. Fortunately, it's been, most of them look like this. And so we're not gonna dwell on this, but figuring out how to sort out the ecology of these springs took, took me a couple of decades because there was so much of this around that there wasn't anything that was uh, helpful to get some insight into how they really function. So springs versus streams. People get these things really confused. Springs are static, uh, discharge temperature, water chemistry, turbidity, and they have weak hydraulic processes. There's, these are Persistent springs that flow all the time, of course. Streams are variable in discharge temperature chemistry and they have strong hydraulic processes. So these really are dramatically different right, environments. And you'll, you, so we get a number of chronobiotic species, so species that occur only in springs. So published work in desert springs. There, there's been some work recently looking at benthic communities that are influenced by disturbance and its magnitude. And this disturbance caused a number of extinctions, of course. Uh, some work's also been done on these, these things, find that the benthic communities are, are a function of dispersal and habitat type. And a lot of work has worked on geochemistry, biogeography of fishes and gastropods. Most of the work on geochemistry is done for consumptive uses, looking people want to use groundwater. How much is there? How much can we take over what time? So basically, you can place uh, springs in, in a regional aquifer setting. There are three basic types of aquifers in the region, mountain aquifers. These are aquifers that are small on mountain blocks. Local aquifers are in valley floors for the most part, and they collect their water from a mountain range and discharge a combination of really what's in a number of mountains, black springs come down and they produce springs that are supported in valley floor springs, Bajada springs, playa and geothermal springs. And then you have regional aquifer springs, aquifer springs that really collect water over large areas. These are all thermal, all high, relatively high electrical conductance. But within this context, we have different biological characteristics of them. Come on. So looking at some springs here, reference springs, find, find, like I said, finding springs are in good condition to, to do some of these types of studies is kind of difficult. But look at these springs from geothermal valley floor, mountain, Bahada, playa, and regional springs scattered throughout the region. Doing multi, I mean, metric multi-dimensional scaling analysis of them find that gee whiz these benthic communities fall out really strongly so these are all statistically significant from one another except for mountain and Bahada springs there's no difference there so you have very strong clustering of geothermal springs regional springs valley floor springs and playa springs and these are springs that are scattered all over the great basin so we don't think this is a real localized Thing at all. So it gives an idea of differences, importance of geochemistry on these, these systems. Chronobiots in these systems are dramatic. 
and, and truly spectacular. There's a lot of plants, mollusks, fishes, insects, amphibians, mammals, crustaceans associated with springs and spring provinces. And most of these things have just been described, well, except the fishes. The mollusks have been described since 1990. So a lot of information there. So we have an integrated earth systems program, NSF project funded is to, to, to look at integrate ecology and hydro, hydrogeology in terms of bio, biological and environmental characters of existing systems and forms how ancient earth processes interact to facilitate the distinctive diversity of chronobiotic species. It's the first such integrated study that I'm aware of anyway. And secondly, we're going to integrate my DNA studies of fishes and gastropods with the Pliocene, Miocene landscape evolution and climate models to determine the ancestral pathways and biogeography of southern Great Basin chronobiomes. So there's some species here. These, there's a puffish, there's a salt creek puffish, they're craig for you. This is Emeropergus, a uh, genus of spring snail. It's found north of uh, Death Valley area. And speckled dace, Rhinicus oscus, more what was widespread species in uh, in Western North America, but there are there is this is an endemic form there in Asian meadows. So we got all these disciplines, and here are the responsibilities: ecology, myself, John Inbrook, my postdoc, Kittle Poor, a uh, PhD student, Brian Hedlund, and Ariel Friel from UNLV, working on data uh, microbes. So we got all these things, and they, and they call hydrogeology, Marty Frisbee and, and, uh, and Seth Myers from, from Purdue, Laura Rademacher from UOP, and in geology and climate, Gary Axon and Fred Phillips from Mexico Institute of Technology, uh, from Federal State University, Will Knotts, and then down to the modeling. So it's a highly integrated thing, and we have a, it was interesting, us all to get together and start talking. Nobody knew what we were talking about. And across disciplines it was just a, a, an absolute delight, actually. So back to a little bit of biogeography here. Uh, this is what's, what's known from a long time ago and from more, more, more recent work. Pleistocene origin of fishes, suckers, minnows, speckled base from northern areas into the Great Basin is pretty well understood. That's basically based on climates and understanding that the lakes you see here, the Pleistocene lakes, and the connectivity between those were, were stepping stones for these things to get in these different systems and differentiate. It's been well accepted and understood. Spring snails and bullfish, puffish, are different. These are found, well, the spring snails we'll talk about are found only in the Death Valley area down here in the lower Death Valley system. As you see where all those arrows converge. And so we know that these northern systems are accessed by organisms by different climates. It's wet enough to, for interbasin connectivity between these systems. Get down here in the Death Valley area, Owens Valley area. We know that these, uh, these fish came from these south, southeastern areas from my DNA work in just a lot of a good old tax, um, morphological taxonomy but we don't know how they did it, where they, how, what was the pathway. So we're gonna focus on the Miocene-Pliocene interaction here. It's gonna understand during the, during the Miocene, there was an extension throughout the Intermountain region where a broad dome that extended from California eastward to Utah began fragmenting north-south mountains and valleys. And this open drainage is on condensation from the ancestral forms of the region. That's what we think. Because even though there's no geological evidence of a flow path and rivers and those kinds of things, we know these, these undeniable the connection of fish and spring snails from this region, southeast. So the Miocene was wetter and warmer than today, but those late submarines persisted into the Miocene. And it's changed in the Pliocene it became much cooler and drier. In the drying climate, we think isolated these aquatic systems from that time and these you know, these chronobionic forms to diverge. So that's kind of a background there of the geology and what's happening. So the work we're we uh, regionally studied this Death Valley system, like I said, including the Owens Valley, Death Valley, I'm Gross River Drainage, and Panama Valley. And this region 
The Sierra Nevada extends from east from the Sierra Nevada here, which of course big 14,000 foot peaks, very lush valley through Death Valley you see in the other picture. So we have this real wide range in in, uh, in topographies and climates that we had to work with. So we had survey data from about a thousand springs that we visited, I visited, and my people, my students had visited over the years. So we knew where they were at elevation. It was a key thing to try to find springs that are not disturbed by humans excessively, and springs that uh, aren't disturbed by natural forces, drying skin, bottoms of gullies, things like that. So we found 46 springs in reference condition, broad range of elevations, temperatures, EC electric conductance, spring work links, short, uh, very long, and residence times very from 89 years to 29,000 years. So the benthic macroinvertebrate diversity, we, we sampled benthic BMIs in all these systems. We had 12,905 individuals and 114 taxa we found in all these springs. In addition, we looked at the chronobionic taxa. Like I said, this region has a lot of them. You can see there on the, the left side, a summary of how many are found in our study area. And the study springs, we think we had a pretty good representation of these things. The extinct taxa, we said, yeah, they're extinct, but we know where the, the springs they occupied before they went extinct. And so the might DNA work, uh, the fair representation center for spring snails and for fish too. So these were all the biological and environmental parameters we collected at each spring. I'm not gonna go through these, just it's a long list. So we got a good feel here for what's you know, relative importance of physical habitat characteristics and chemical water chemistry. Doing a chronological kind of correspondence analysis, the water, water chemistry, we find that only calcium, strontium, EC temperature were, were important. None of those environmental uh, physical habitat characteristics were important to structure in the benthic communities. Kind of surprising. Not surprising elevation and temperature were very important there in opposition to each other because the higher, higher elevations, you got lower temperatures. Doing a structural equation modeling, just look at spring snails basically and seeing which factors were important. You see the total dissolved solids and conductance were statistically significant. C14, age of the water and calcium carbonate were statistically significant. Tritium was not significant, not significant probably just because there wasn't enough left in the water, I think. Spring snail abundance, number of cryobionics, cryobionics presence in a spring and pergolops divergence were all present, significant too. So if we look at this, physical and biological parameters are important for spring snails. Pergolops is the genus of spring BMI abundance, presence, spring snails, a very short list. We get down the physical characteristics, not, not important. So that gives us a, a little bit of insight here. So in reference springs, it seems like geochemistry is the most important factor driving, driving the structure of these communities. In the Serb Springs, the habitat is habitat's more important. And so you, you imagine as you try to restore this system here, you see on the right, it's in bad shape. It might go back to historical conditions, provided that nothing's gone extinct in it. So now it gets really interesting. Look at pergolopsis, divergence times, and residence times of water. So just look at the present divergence here and the mean divergence of a million years. You know, I think uh, divergence per million years, like 1.6 million years per percent, percent divergence. And you can see as you get older residence time, you have more, you have a number of species there. Um, old species have been diverse from ancient things for a long time. Younger, younger waters, lower residence time, you have younger species. There are species that have not uh, been there that long. And then you look at the residence time versus the number of back taxa in the spring. This is really impressive. Over the water, the more species you have in a spring is very chronobiotic.
So this is a landscape evolution model put, put together by a grad student, at, uh, Brandon Lutz at Mexico Tech. So you look at 12 million years ago, it was close together, spread apart, and today is moving this direction. Pretty impressive, huh? Not cool. So you can see the opening of, of uh, let me see here. Let me get a, get my pointer here. You can see the opening in the Owens Valley, Death Valley, Brunt Valley. And this is So they've done this through understanding all the, the faults, dating a lot of the flows, and they, they can put this together. So if you take that and, and look at it in something that's just hot off the press, and we, I'm sorry, this is a bad, pretty bad looking. So, Looking at this, oh, come on. Yeah, looking at the ages of these doggone Gurgulopsis that go from, like, like a clock of age from eight, from ancestral forms of 0.52 million to, to uh, 3.64 million years. The, the, tree, the, the most recent ones are from coastal California. All those ones are from Gila River, New Mexico. Hypnobius. It's not, we didn't really look at this because it's so old and not very well understood, but it's a known the genus species in Furnace Creek Springs in Death Valley. But it came from North Central Mexico. Fishes, so I print on pupfish. So they vary from 2.3 million to 3.3 million. And in particular, this really an old thing came from Central Mexico, in particular pool fishes. So all this came from that area. So Brandon put these things together to this chart and this this is not easy to see but I think it's it's illustrative anyway. So he what he did is look at these openings and related the age of spring snails to these these openings and came so they do his modeling Landscape of evolution shows pathways were, that were open to these things on this from these different directions. So it appears that there's good confirmation between landscape evolution and the mitochondrial DNA evidence of the antiquity of these things. So about, that's about it. Contrary to the other system, water chemistry is the most important factor affecting BMI communities. Water chemistry and residence time are most important factors in the presence of abundance of chronic biots. Residence time appears to be a factor of aquatic persistence, an indicator of aquatic persistence. The number of chronic biots in the spring is an indicator of residence time. So it's no way to tell that these old water springs have persisted for millions of years, but the relationship between the number of attacks in these springs and the groundwater age is an indication that that's the kind of spring that was, has been persistent for such a long time. The modeling yeah. landscape evolution is temporarily and spatially consistent with the dates of divergence created by gastropods and fishes from ancestral forms. And so NSF has paid for a lot of this, a lot of this work also has paid for Death Valley, Sea Los Angeles, International Forest, important collaborators on the NSF thing. So with that, I'll take questions. Thanks, Don. If you keep your presentation up, uh, just in case somebody wants to look you to go back to a slide. Sure. And people could put their questions in the chat or just uh, unmute and start talking. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask Don to start off. Um, so it's, um, it, I think what the, so the residence time, I think this is what you're saying at the end is that it's a proxy uh, for permanence, maybe that uh, one, that those are the most permanent springs and the ones that are 
have the lowest resonance times might be more uh, newer or more temporary? Yeah, I think so. That's, uh, I'd say a proxy is a good way to put it, Craig, yeah. And then um, you talked about this uh, uh, habitat as uh, the main factor for springs have been disturbed. Uh, would that include invasive species uh, or are we looking mostly at physical uh, characteristics of the habitat? Physical characteristics. We have not spent enough time looking at the biological uh, invasives. Interestingly, most of those are in the uh, big regional aquifer springs with old water. And yeah. Oh, the invasives have mostly invaded the old, the more, um, per, the older springs? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Where you find crayfish. And... So is, is that also, is um, spring size or discharge also uh, uh, correlated with residence time? No. Oh. You can have all the uh, new springs with big, big discharges. Okay. I was just curious because of the invasive species um, portion. Well, the big springs are usually pretty, you know, pretty badly used. There's, there, but you can get, get some really good ones too, like Hyderabad Springs in Death Valley. Long walk into the thing, and it's permanent. It flows to three or four CFS. Uh, Ash Meadow Spring, what is it? The crystal Pool flows ten CFS. But it's got crayfish and. Crayfish are probably the worst thing for benthics. And uh, Cambuzi and things like that. So I'd say basically, yeah, more, more likely to get invasives in larger waters. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. You, know, you don't have any invasives in Travertine Springs in Death Valley National Park. You have five endemics there. So many you know, they're too small for fish, and uh, they don't have any invasive fish. They're kind of isolated, so invasive snails, anything else, and uh, or crawdads. So for the uh, snails, um, you know, the, even Darwin talked about snails getting around on birds' feet. Um, you, Yet the divergence time. I, uh, what are your thoughts on the how the snails get to these, especially ones up on like on a mountain um, that may not have ever been connected to surface water? What um, do you have any thoughts on uh, snail dispersal and vicariance? Well, that's a little question, of course, and nobody knows the answer. But I've done some work, some experimental work, where uh, if I can, an article will be. It's almost done talking about this. We took three species of spring snails in Bishop, California. Two are endemic to the Owens Valley, one isn't. And did some work looking at how long they would survive in just on a piece of filter paper. We uh, several on a piece of filter paper for a period of time. We added their home spring water back. If they crawled away, they were still alive. If they didn't, they were dead. That, in that way, they, they, they didn't live more than. 15 minutes. Then we tried it with, uh, in, this held constant, constant cool temperature, and we uh, put some water on these filter pieces of filter paper, covered them, and every 15 minutes we try another trial and, and uh, we had to add water. And gosh darn, they lived until they lived about two and a half hours. So, whoa, they get a lot of ways, you know, thinking that the moist filter paper might, might simulate birds wet bird's feathers. They can move a lot, not a long distance, two and a half hours over time, certainly. So then we got down to the end of the experiments there and ran out of water from one of the springs. And I said, go, go get some, let's just get some tap water here for her bishop well. Good quality groundwater, there was no, no chlorine in it or anything. Added that and they died. So that made me, makes me think they're really tied into the geochemistry of individual springs. I've tried to translocate spring snails and it hasn't worked. Mm. They don't take. Mm. And, and so I think, but to back up a little bit, so you know, 
they had to, they had to get into this region, they had to be come from and didn't come from birds. The other thing is that if you have so this endemism, you know, species that are endemic to single springs or in single valleys in the Great Basin, if you had easy one by birds, there would be much greater mixing. You wouldn't have this endemism, I don't think. And then uh, the other thing is that you know, trying to, to establish populations that have been extirpated is just really hard. You can't take them from another spring and put them in a spring and then you expect them to take. So they yeah, occupy, okay. these, these okay. guys occupy a wide variety of habitats. They, they occupy rivers, they occupy lakes, they occupy springs. So they have some genetic ability there, I think. Be very adaptable to different conditions. And probably rapidly adapt to different conditions. They can't acclimate quickly. Okay. We have a question from uh, uh, Marinasate. Yeah, so, um, hi, Don. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, but I think we met a few years ago, uh, quite a few, when I uh, interviewed at DRI. Um, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and at the time, I think um, the problem was that I, I was moving from Ireland and it was unclear if I could bring in enough funding to support myself. Um, anyway, uh, I'm at NDSU and doing fine. Um, the, the question I have, Don, is, are there, are there maybe any, is there any information from other large systems that could shed light on some of the questions you're asking? And I'm thinking particularly of uh, the, the greater Yellowstone region. Um, you know, Yellowstone is an interesting one because a lot of those springs are inside the caldera. And so there would be barriers to movement from outside the system. I wonder if there's anything known about that. Well, most of the work that's been done on the, the uh, Yellowstone system has been done with extremophiles. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But there are also freshwater springs. You know, there are thousands of springs, some that, that don't have any invertebrates in them. But there are others that certainly do. So I'm just wondering if anybody has looked at those. I'm not aware of any work that's been done there. Ah, there's there's a niche there. <laughs> well, there's so many things. It's, it's, it's been a long, dry period trying to get funding to work on springs. Very long, very dry. Well, and I know, and I so when I moved to the U.S., I did some work on Yellowstone, mostly related to plants, but it was very hard to get funding for that. Um, and so we, in the end, we kind of gave up. But I need to go back and do stuff there. I think so. Thanks, yeah, thanks for your answer. We can we can talk more later. I have some other questions for you. Yeah, the other thing is that the microbial end of things here, the mi microbiologists have found a huge degree of endemism for microbes in, you know, in all these springs. Each spring has a number of endemics. You know, hundreds, thousands of them. It's just, I don't, I don't know how to get my arms wrapped around that. I didn't mention that in my talk at all because I, can, I, can, I don't understand, I don't get it. It's just, but it's, it's quite extraordinary. It's just phenomenal. It, yeah, uh, one I, I became aware of, there's a, a grass called uh, Dicanthelium linosa, and there's a, basically a subspecies of it that only grows in the range of 40 to 60 degrees. This is a plant. And in order to do that, it must have a symbiosis with a fungus. But when they looked a bit more, and this is mostly from uh, Montana State, they found that the fungus then needs to be infected with a particular virus. So it's a tripartite symbiosis that conveys the heat tolerance. And then they go to 60 degrees Celsius. It's just mind blowing. Uh, we can just take questions if anybody wants to unmute themselves or put something in the chat. If, if um, nobody goes, I'll have another question. Sure. Or, or more a proposal for Don. <laughs> I, I, because I worked also in Yellowstone, um, and, and most of my activity is in, in wetlands, in the Society of Wetland Scientists, um, I became well aware that their two springs, be they hot or cold, are really not recognized by wetlands people as being wetlands. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and they are, they, they comply with every definition that you might come up with. Um, and so um, that, and so I'm the editor in chief of the journal Wetlands and I would love to see uh, a good review on spring, spring based ecosystems. Um, so I'm wondering if you would be interested in doing that and maybe Craig can help as well. Um, and I, I assume you also know David Cooper. He would probably be uh, interested in, in working with that. So sure. just, you don't have to say yay or nay now, but <laughs> I, you know, it, it could potentially be a really good review paper. Um, and we have the special series called the Mark Brinson Reviews. And I can see how that could fit in that, uh, in that group. So uh, just food for thought, if you're interested. I, um, I'm not seeing any more chat, but I, I'll ask one last question. And um, if you could go back, it may crash you out again, but that animation. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so my understanding from what that the the minnows came in from California, right? But the spring snails came in from Mexico, along with the pupfish and the pullfish. And that yeah. happened concurrent with this expansion as the, these were being, I imagine this is um, tectonically derived uh, spreading going on. Yes. That is really cool. That is really amazing. What are the uh, yellow uh, triangles indicating? They're indicating speed and distance. Oh, okay. So they're just the anchors. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Yeah, you should, and to see this, you know, from the uh, lateral views, just extraordinary. You see Owens Valley, Owens Valley, Death Valley. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So I think uh, there, I think a number of students have been out to Death Valley. Could you point out where uh, that is on this? Um, your pointer, or, I mean, the pointer is what caused the problem. Yes, I have a pointer on it. You see it? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Death Valley. This, this is Sierra Nevada. Spring Mountains, so Owens Valley. Yeah, that's really interesting because you know, when fish biologists, at least the way I was trained, you often talk about the diversity of like the pub fishes, and there's it. Often the story here is, oh, they got isolated in the Pleistocene, but as you know, it's a lot more complicated than that, right? I mean, there's <laughs> evolution didn't begin at the Pleistocene. It, it just, uh, it, it may have erased some of the earlier stories, right? Um, but this really shows kind of how dynamic that system's been. Really cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the Pleistocene, I think, you know, the Northern northern Great Basin, that's Pleistocene. And it's pretty clear that, you know, the, it, look at lake terraces and that kind of stuff. You know when you can date those things, you know when these things overflowed. And you can see the fish, <laughs> And their stepping stone relationship to, to those things to the north. And the thing, same is true in the Owens Valley, too. You get uh, suckers, speckled basin, tui chub from the Lahontan system down into the Owens system. The pupfish came from down southwest, uh, southeast, and with much greater antiquity. They, they uh, you know, they, they were there 3.3, so late Miocene early Pliocene. So yeah. pretty. Pretty extraordinary. They, they've been there a long time. And, you know, Minkley, Minkley suggested this a long time ago, imports of tectonisms. He said, he took it a little bit different. He said that Owens Valley, and maybe this is not too much, Owens Pupfish rode the tectonic plate to the west to get isolated. Because it's the most divergent of the Death Valley group. And then the, um, I thought, so was there a second invasion of pupfishes again from the south into Death Valley? after Owens uh, got isolated. That's the story I seem to recall. Yeah, Tony Kelly's done all this work and he, he, uh, he scratched his head. So those were 2.3 million years. So he thinks what happens was there was, a, there was an initial invasion of fish that got into Death Valley and probably got up to the Owens Valley too. And then the secondary invasion didn't get the Owens Valley, just got to the Death Valley. And so those hybridized with the resident of fish that were there, and resulting in these that uh, this hybrid swarm, if you will, I guess. And like our clock dates are not that old. Oh, so. interesting. Thank you. 
Last chance for chats. <laughs> I'm not seeing any. Well, thanks, Don. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I know a, a few of us have talked about sticking around after, maybe following up on some of the discussions like what Maris had. And, um, and so uh, I think we can all thank you. And for those of folks who want to stick around, we'll have another follow up discussion. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Don. Outstanding talk. Thanks, Don.